child Then your skin can bring you so much pain Now I hear you say You got the best of both ways I want you come and take a walk in my shoes And tell me if you take my place Oh no Got to do it. Uh, welcome to episode number 114 the Inside Running Podcast. Thanks for joining us for another week. This week's episode is sponsored by our friends at Sticks Brewery out of Newcastle. Uh, they're sponsoring the show this week because they're in the running for the hottest 100 craft beers and they need our help to uh, vote for the Inside Running Pale Ale. So if your listeners out there, you can go to a website. It's Gab's Hottest 100 Craft Beers. We'll put a link in the show notes before January 17th. Give us a few votes for the beers. That'd be uh, really appreciated. Welcome to my co-host uh, up in Canberra, being in Batemans Bay. Been a very dramatic week for Bradley since last time we spoke. Welcome to the show, Bradley Croker. Thanks, Brady. Yeah, I've been a bit off the grid the last week. And um, yeah, there's no risk of fires here at the moment, but the uh, yeah, the breathing's not so great. <laughs> Good to hear your voice, because last time we heard your voice, you um you got off air, you were going to go eat a meat pie on New Year's Eve, and then you were going to go watch some sandcastle sculpting. Correct. Neither happened. <laughs> yeah. We're doing it. Well, welcome to Moose as well. How are you going? Uh, I'm still here, mate. Just there. kicking along. You got any dramatic stories from down your way to share tonight? Anything dramatic happened in my life? Um, nah, nothing dramatic here. Nothing a lot right. going on, though. It's been a bit a bit scary. Has a bit, hasn't it? Not so much in the running world, but down here in Australia, it's uh, hitting mm. news all over the place, these fires. Maybe, Bradley, you kick us off and tell us how your week panned out, how you were affected. Um, yeah, so from a running point of view, I, I ran 38.5K. Um, so on the Monday, I just did uh, 45 minutes in the morning. Actually, Viv came out on the bike, um, so we just did laps around Surfside, and then we recorded that night, and... Um, yeah, as I said to you, that uh, we're going to go and have meat pies for lunch and go down and watch some uh, watch a sand sculpting competition. Um, and also said I was going to go and get off the road and run down at Runnyford Road, where I ran with um, McGowan and, and uh, Matt Johnson about a month earlier for our long run. And I said to Viv, oh, I'll get up, I'll get up in the morning and go down there and do that. So then Tuesday morning, which is New Year's Eve, woke up. And uh, Viv showed me a video. She goes, oh, I don't think you'll be running at Runningford Road. Uh, it was on fire. Um, and it was just super hot outside. And, yeah, you looked out and you could, it was just anywhere, anywhere to the south was just black. Um, so we knew that it was going to be a pretty intense day. So I actually headed over to Batemans Bay just to grab some supplies, like some milk and bread in case things went pear-shaped and we lost power and um, supermarkets closed down and also got some petrol and it was a ghost town. Like I put some photos up on Facebook and Batemans Bay uh, on New Year's Eve, like you wouldn't be, you would never be able to get a park. They have a section for overflow um, because it's just a tourist mecca. Um, but I could park in the main street. <laughs> it was a ghost town. Um, so I did that and then we headed back and, yeah, we're on the north side of the bay and it was like 38, 39 degrees um, super windy and so we were just swimming sort of every 20 30 minutes and just watching the water bombers bombing the south well, pretty much everywhere south down the coast um, we heard explosions which got into the um, back of the industrial estate at Batemans Bay so businesses were going up there and you just hear these loud booms and you just felt so useless like I think it was at that point where I went you know what I'm at some point I'm going to um I'm going to volunteer with the rural fire service because you just like you know you, you're relatively fit and healthy and you just go well, what am I doing here just sitting on the beach while you know houses are being burnt so um yeah then about midday we weren't really we didn't feel like we were under threat at that point midday it went it went eerie like it was like a scene out of like dante's peak or something um day turned to night it was like this real ready orange sort of feel uh, and then we lost power for two days so um yeah that was a bit uh yeah a bit um yeah surreal and supermarkets were down uh, they did open 
and they were just taking cash only, but there was like three hour lines to get in. Um, and even when the power came back on, they were still only taking cash and the supermarkets were out of everything. Um, like you couldn't get milk, couldn't even get long life milk. Um, baby formula was getting pretty low, um, not much bread. So yeah, so I didn't run New Year's Eve or New Year's Day. Um, and then the biggest issue was they knew it was going to be bad again on the Saturday and they wanted to get like all the tourists out of town. But the problem was the road north was being on and off, clo- like open then closed. That so was a bit unpredictable. South, you couldn't go the main road. You had to pretty much go into every small town along the way. So it would have been like probably a nine-hour trip. So we decided to stay down just because the air quality was better in Batemans Bay um, and I just couldn't stand being stuck in traffic, especially when potentially the road gets blocked and you have to turn around anyway. Um, which happened to a few people that were were down near us. So we stayed on the we stayed till the Saturday, um, yeah. And then that's when it probably got worse for us. Um, around lunchtime, a fire got uh, in the back of our suburb, and the fireys came down and said to expect some sort of ember attacks. Uh, so at that point, Viv and Lily and Viv's mum headed to the beach, which is only a couple hundred meters away. And Viv's dad and I sort of just were hosing down the house, um, just getting ready, but. Luckily, the water bombers, like they're amazing. These like these are the helicopter, yeah, the helicopters with the hoses or the buckets. They come in, and they pretty much just stopped stopped that threat for us. So, um, but then we lost power for another couple of days, um, and then yeah, we came back on this on last night, uh, and when we came back, there's still no power there. So, uh, yeah, it was um, yeah, even driving home last night because we had to drive south through all the towns that were pretty much. Um, destroyed like Cabago is on the highway and um, yeah the main street like big buildings are just um, are a mess and um, even driving home visibility was like 100 meters a lot of the way home because it's just so thick the smoke so uh, that was my week in terms of running um, yeah did that run on the Monday got out on the 2nd of Jan uh, did an hour at 403 sort of ran through Batemans Bay um, through How like smoky was that? Now, actually, then that, that's that was a surprising thing. Was the air down there was was way better than like you'd think it, it doesn't make sense that you're that close to the fires, but obviously because of the um, I don't know, the sea breeze or the the direction of the wind, it wasn't that bad, um, and that's why we decided to stay because we thought well. Camera's been so bad that it's not great for Lily to be sort of breathing this in, and we felt relatively safe, so we thought we'd stay. Um, so I did that on the second, then on the third, just 55 minutes at four twelves. Didn't run Saturday, and then yeah, we made the decision to drive back uh, late last night. Um, yeah, so that was that was my week. Um, did you get some, yeah, pretty. Did you get some strange looks when you were out jogging? Like, sure, you're the only person exercising in the whole of Batemans Bay. Uh, no, I wouldn't say I got funny looks because, yeah, because the air quality was it was pretty good down there. I don't think anybody um, thought too much of it. I did get uh, on one of the runs because there's so much media down there, um, because we're on the north side of the bay, the only way to get across to the south is via the bridge. And I was coming back across the bridge at about uh, maybe five past five. And so the five o'clock news was on. And they, they took up the whole path. That, like, there was a guy there, you know, there was the, the cameraman and the presenter, and then there was this other guy about five metres away stopping traffic. So I was on my run, and he's like, oh, you know, come back in two minutes or something. So I went back and did a loop and then came back. Um, yes, yeah, so there was a fair bit of media down there. But, no, I didn't get, didn't get that many looks. Um, yeah, so it was, yeah, it was a pretty surreal experience. A um, few positives That's... come out late. Sorry, go, Moose. Oh, um, at any time we would advise to leave, when we would advise to leave, and by who, and how um, were you advised? So we were advised, well, after the New Year's attack, those couple of days, once we got power back, all we had, we didn't have any TV, so there was no TV reception um, after the first fire. So all we had was the radio, and they are pretty much saying that, like, any tourist um, just leave um we we don't want you here and i guess technically we are tourists but viv's parents spend a lot of time down there and um as i said like the, the air was better um where we were was a low risk area um and we spoke to a guy it was a couple 
couple of couple of doors up, he um he's part of the fireys, and he said, look, it's a pretty it's a pretty small risk, um, but he still got rid of his his uh his kids all headed down to Shepparton, um, so he got them out of there. Um, but we felt felt relatively safe. But then on on the Saturday fire, um, yeah, the fireys came down and said, um, you know, it's burning pretty pretty hard a couple of kilometres away so you know expect some ember attacks and it was on the radio to to evacuate as well most scared um, you've ever been in your life bradley uh well probably not like i i felt where it started to get real real was when they said ember attacks are on their way and when that's when viv and lily went to the beach and i'm like all right this is sort of getting real now like put on sort of a long sleeve shirt and some um <laughs> shoes rather than thongs and started just you know hosing hosing the deck down trying to get as high because it's a two-story house so just trying to get as high as we can to get up and um hose down the roof and uh but then yeah as, as i said the bombers just they were amazing like in that small area because bateman's bay wasn't a, wasn't a major fire they still had like two or three helicopters so you'd imagine uh like all down the coast like because this thing's grown like it's a bloody tumor like it's been going for five weeks but there's certainly worse areas in Bateman's Bay. So if they're putting the same resources into those areas, they've done a pretty good job. Yeah. Um, mm. But I feel sorry for the, like, obviously people lose their lives, their houses, the animals die. But um, I also feel sorry for a lot of businesses down there um, because I, my parents owned a bakery uh, in Aladulla for 30 odd years. And like this time of the year is make or break for a lot of those businesses because winter's it's a ghost town down there. So they really rely on on this tourism period. Um, and I remember when mum and dad had the business, they would hate it if, you know, if they got some really bad weather, people in the caravan parks would just go, oh, let's go home early. Um, and so this is obviously more extreme than that. But there's going to be a lot of businesses that, um, yeah, will, will struggle after this. And even um, – there's a, a town called Braidwood, which if you're going from Canberra to Batemans Bay, everybody drives through it. No one's been able to get through there for the last five weeks. So that place is pretty much shut down. So, um, yeah, I feel, I feel sorry for those uh, those people uh, with businesses down there. Well put. Mm. Back in the Canberra smoke now, though. <laughs> yeah, got back last night. And, um, Worst the city vis- in the yeah, world. Visibility. Yeah, it's it was so bad. Um, and even today, like I haven't really been out much, but – it's it's impossible to keep the smoke out because it gets into the garage and um yeah like just breathing it in all day you sort of end up with that sort of bit of a headache and so i haven't run today and i'm I'm not sure when i'm going to run um i just don't see much point in it like you know going out for an hour is it is the harm does the harm outweigh the good yeah so probably it does if you go outside Mm. but if if you can find somewhere where there's sort of shut shut there like you said your gym opens the door right <laughs> yeah so. so we drove past today when we we're down at the soup down the supermarket drove past the gym and the front door was open so i'm like well it's probably not much different to run outside <laughs> that is dumb. can't make that up <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> time to find a new gym i reckon oh well it's good you're all in one piece we had a lot of listeners write in asking how you were going and making sure you're all right and it was a yes we pretty much didn't hear from you from you for like 48 hours i think uh we recorded monday we were talking tuesday Mm. morning and then it wasn't until thursday morning that you got oh yeah i woke up to a message from you thursday morning yeah and then went off again saturday and then actually powered down there because his parents stayed um power only came on today from Saturday lunch, yeah, from Saturday afternoon. So they've been been out of, uh, without power for a while. Mm. Right, yeah, Moose, mm. give us some stats. You had a big running week. Tell us all about it. Uh, yeah, I did have a big running week. I went to the gym on Monday morning and ran. I think I ran there. Maybe I ran, oh, I don't know. I ran it before the gym, then in the afternoon. Oh, no, sorry. I ran in the morning. Ran um, with Watto from his house. He's got a pool, jumped in the pool afterwards. It was quite refreshing. Uh, we just cruised because I was pretty rooted after Sunday. So, um, yeah, 200, what is it, 20? I, I ran, even even on a flat run, it was like 206 metres still of climbing. It's really hard to find flat spots around here, even when you're trying your hardest not to. Uh, 15K and then in the Arvo, Got out because this was a this was the Monday 
if, um, yeah, still everyone was still away. Ballarat turns to a ghost town over this period between Christmas and New Year. It's real empty. Everyone goes to the coast or up to the river. Um, they also go to like the mountain areas. So it was real empty and uh, felt a bit strange running. Went to the gym in the other. Then Tuesday, I did do a workout. Uh, let me just check what it was. Um, I think I did six by K. Yep. So I ran around the lake. Uh, young fella's just come back from um, Melbourne where he was at boarding school. Nick Fidley is a good runner. He's going to be a gun. I think he's trying to make his goal is to make World Cross. So brought him down to the group for the first time. Got 3K into the warm up. And I asked him, oh, how long do you normally warm up for, Nick? And he said, 2K. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> he also does really fast reps with lots of rest. And, uh, yeah, he did four of the Ks. I did six of them. It was about, I think, I about 257s to 303s maybe. Oh, no, the last one was in a dead headwind, 307s. But 90 seconds recovery. So felt like I was just starting to get back with this run. And then jogged in the other um, jog from work, I believe. Uh, then Wednesday, I was in Melbourne. So that was, um, oh, actually, that was New Year's Eve. So, yeah, went to Melbourne and got out um, got out on the piss, you know how it goes, <laughs> and then woke up in the morning, bit rusty, ran around Prince's Park uh, with Cole and Matt, who we were up there with for dinner. A few people out, not that many, you know, New Year's, New Year's Day morning, it was pretty empty, which was disappointing. And then in the afternoon, jumped back to Ballarat, did my good loop, <clears throat> eight and a half K. Thursday, went out on the moose loop, which is a loop I got here, about 17 Ks, and I decided to add some surges in, so 12 by 30 second hard, 90 second easy, and then I added 12 by 15 hard, 45 seconds easy. So the idea was to turn the legs over, change gears, that kind of thing. I felt all right. Uh, afternoon, ran with me mate, Matty Freeman. Friday, oh, I took out Rad, you know, our mate Rad, the um, strength guy. Yeah, he's been Radford, on. Yep. He's been on. Yep. <clears throat> took him out, classic footy player. Took him out for a <laughs> about an hour run, ran 30 minutes out. He was chuffing along, just killing it, big strides, loping. And I thought, geez, he's going pretty quick. And then at about the 5K mark, just started to hear some real noise coming from his way. Lots of huffing and puffing and <laughs> this kind of stuff. So we had to take a bit of a breather. And then he uh, he absolutely died on the way back. It was about, <laughs> I was babysitting him on the way home, holding his hand as we got back to the gym. <laughs> Classic footy player mentality. Just flog yourself the first few K and then hold on. That afternoon, actually, I went to, um, you know, that Boston Marathon thing I was telling you about. Went down to have a look at some of the, the shooting locations they had mapped out in Geelong. And so I ran after that. It's pretty smoky. So down there, I was sitting out there for lunch. Uh, and it was beautiful day, clear sky. And then within like 10 minutes, it turned into a, a haze. That's how quick the smoke came in. And then it kind of dissipated and I ran. And I ran around the river there. Nice place to run the Barwon River. Saturday morning, two by 12 minutes at fresh heart rate. So just chuck the heart rate on. Try to try to aim to keep it between like 168, 175. So did that. Average 312 and then 316. Two and a half minutes between in the afternoon. And with some big boys. Can't remember who it was, but they're obviously some of the bigger crowd I run with based on my title of my Strava. And then Sunday morning, third wheel with Mona and Berkey. So Mona and Berkey have a bit of a love affair going on, and I just felt a little uncomfortable with those boys. But freezing cold, feels like two degrees. Can you un can you believe that? That is, is that not the most insane thing? Smoky from, from bushfires felt mm. like two degrees. I had to wear a jacket. I would have worn gloves if I... If I um, knew it was going to be that cold, I had numb fingers. Just unbelievably cold. Ran 30k though, first 30k for ages. Uh, battled late, 536 meters, so a bit hilly. But
but battled late for sure. And um, I, I, I was saying I, I, to the boys, I reckon the first two to three long runs back, that they they hurt, and then you start getting comfortable over the long runs. But there's a bit of an adaption period. Did Mike and, run thirty, or was he on the bike? Oh no, he's on the bike. Yeah, he's on the bike. Yeah. Uh, Does he hand you drinks and stuff, or just there for entertainment? Oh, uh, he gave me a drink of his drink bottle that was there, and he gave me it, and I had a sip, and he's like, "I thought, what the fuck is this? It tastes disgusting." Oh, I don't like water. So I put lemon juice in my water. Lemon juice? <laughs> Just the most sour, disgusting taste you'll ever think. It's yeah. zesty for you. <laughs> Maybe that's the secret, Moose. <laughs> this is so... Lemon water. But yeah, he comes out, talks a bunch of rubbish and makes the run go quicker. It's good he gets out there, keeps yeah. part of the scene. It's amazing. Yeah, it's really cool, actually. And then he came on the bike for a little bit in the afternoon. I ran with... Uh, I had a mate pistol down... And then we ran with um, a few boys and they're a lap of the lake, a little bit extra. Yeah, it's good. Good week, 176K. And, yeah, just another piece of the puzzle. Mm. 100, so 176K. Brad, I reckon he's building for a marathon shortly. He's getting there. Mm. He's, got the right. fire, he's got the fire back. Heard some whispers about which one. I want you to come to country one. champs, actually. I want you to come to country champs. Vic country champs. Yeah, I'm gonna write in your program now. Yeah. Uh, and you'll and, and you'll smash you the week of. <laughs> <laughs> he's starting to go all right again, isn't he, Bradley? Yeah, yeah, he's getting there. As he said, he's you know, thirty K I reckon another two weeks. When's two weeks, yeah. When's, yeah. when's big country can chance? Two weeks. Two I weeks. think it's I think you'd have him at the moment, Brady. Uh what are you doing to do, Moose? The ten K there? Nah, five K. Five K. Jeez. Shooting for you know, a 08. You know, it's a good um, indication how well you're going with how much banter you got going in the group. That's a good indication. You I mean reckon. you personally? Oh, the group in general, whoever's there. If they're, if they're starting to chirp up a bit, getting a bit lippy, then that's, uh, that's a good sign that they're quietly confident, I reckon. Yeah. If, they, if, they're off, if they're hanging at the back, just holding on, keeping real quiet, just avoiding any banter. Yeah. That's that's a sign they're battling. Hat pulled Probably down not. like over their eyes kind of thing, just keeping a low profile. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, boy. Or oh, stopping to drop the shoelace. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Sorry, boys. Need a piss. Need yeah. a piss. Four toilet breaks <laughs> in the long run. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you about my week. I thought I was going to be up at Falls Creek the whole time, but I only lasted up there for uh, four days in total. Not sure how much altitude benefit I got from four days up there, but all good. Uh, did my 14k by myself on the Monday just because that group goes at 9 30 and I was up at like five with the baby and probably a bit too long to wait around so I uh, went solo for 14k uh, average 422s felt pretty poppy actually for a Monday morning felt good did uh, the group run in the afternoon at 5 30 and did some strides after that so that was kind of 9k all up after the strides had a bit of a good group there Daniel Wallace the beast Nick Earl all these names are popping up on uh, Strava here, James Coleman. On uh, Tuesday morning up there, I met up with Jared Clifford, uh, Tim Logan, Jordan Tyler, and this younger fella that I have, Callum Davies. You guys remember he won the Zatapec 1500 metre race? Has the hat Queenslander. on. Queenslander. Yeah. yeah the- oh, the hat. The, the fella with the hat. The fella with the hat. Nearly won Albie Thomas Mile as well. If you watch that video, he kind of got checked right at the end there he kind of got cut off a bit he should have probably won that if you look at the footage yeah so where well, he's going to world juniors so i don't know much about junior kids but um now i know a lot about him now because he absolutely put me to the sword in this workout um <laughs> we did, he did six by one k i did eight by one k we did him on the aqueduct there um instructions were to hit like 255s moose but we kind of were going probably a bit too a bit slower than that like it was just probably digging a bit too deep to be hitting 255s let me open up these uh k splits here we just went from like some random pole to another random pole so i'm not exactly sure how accurate they were but they come up pretty close on strava 259 tailwind one way 306 headwind the other way 258 303 3 302 uh, three, three oh five. Not sure if I read out eight. Then might have skipped a couple. 
Anyway, <laughs> um, you can check my Strava if you want to 100% know that. But uh, yeah, Callum Davies, he was he's a smooth operator, boys. He just looks like he's mm. jogging. He had the hat on again, the signature hat. He's just wearing like Zoom flies, like a heavier kind of training shoe. Punched, I think, his last one in like 2.49. Made us all look like we were power walking out the back there. Watch this space for that guy. It was good to... Uh, who, yeah. uh, who coaches him? Oh, I'm not 100% sure. Oh, actually, I did ask him that, Bradley. Yeah, an older gentleman, he said, has been coaching him for a long time up at Queensland. I didn't recognise his name. But, um, yeah, been with the same coach for a long time. And I think he does a bit of his own like self-coaching on his days off. Like this guy just maybe writes his workouts for him and then he listens to his body on the other nights. So, um, yeah, he was in that world, um, Juniors 1500s with um, Inga Britson, the mm. young fella. Like he's, yeah, he's legit, this guy. So, um, yeah, so that was good. Good to train with a few people. Um, probably noticed the altitude a bit early on. Like I feel like you're blowing a bit too hard in the first minute of every rep. But then by two, two and a half minutes, you kind of settled down a bit more. Uh, went out for the Arvo run with the group. There was actually, there was a bit of lightning throughout the afternoon and there was a couple of fires that started from the lightning. And we kind of ran that afternoon loop to where they were kind of working on one of the fires there. That didn't turn into anything special. Um, then Wednesday, ran by myself again. Listen to uh, Kate Smythe and Soph Ryan on one of the episodes we put out, I think it was last Saturday, maybe the Saturday before, all about um, all about women's hormones and stuff like that. I learned a stack of stuff. Even uh, even for a guy listening to that stuff, I, f- I totally recommend it if you want to understand the female body and how that can affect performance and running and all that kind of stuff. It was uh, one of those ones that you listen to and you're like, I feel like I should be paying for this kind of content. So that was Wednesday morning. Uh, Wednesday night, we decided to leave Falls Creek. So we got to watch an act warning just through like the app on our phones and... Um, Probably at the time we thought we were kind of overreacting, like nobody else seemed to leave on that Wednesday night there and there was a bit of smoke coming into the valley and um, I kind of just packed up half my stuff thinking that we'd probably go back up to the mountain. We kind of had our relatives just near Myrtleford, so uh, we kind of decided to drive down there, stay with them for the night on Wednesday night, um, leave a bit of stuff up the top there and if we had to, uh, we could get back and get it or, um, or we could go home from there. But the fires got worse on the Wednesday, on the Thursday. This is now, and um, everyone ended up having to be evacuated from there or leaving there by Friday morning. So um, we stayed at Carly's relatives for Thursday and Friday before heading back to Echuca. The smoke was super bad down there, and like they live probably 15 minutes out of Myrtleford on this um, on this country road, and there's like nowhere to run, and like smoke was super bad and. Even uh, Carly's uncle told me if I'm going to go for a run, make sure I look out for snakes and run in the middle of the road because there's snakes everywhere up there. He ended up shooting a shooting a red belly in one of the paddocks when we were up there one night. So I was like, nah, that's my decision made. I'm definitely, <laughs> I'm definitely not running because there's smoke and snake danger. So I pretty much had all of Thursday off, all of Friday off until we got home to Echuca and it was like 43 degrees or something. I went out for like a... 30-minute jog um, Friday night, did a workout Saturday morning. I did five 400s off a minute, um, then a 15-minute threshold, and then another five by 400 metres, and I had three minutes between the fours and the threshold. So a good session, a bit of a mix of everything. Quite enjoyed this one. It was super hot, so I just really made sure I um, relaxed in that threshold. I think I averaged maybe 323. Three, 324 pace so um, usually when I'm kind of working at threshold pace I'm kind of around 310 but I think it was like 35 degrees when I did the workout most of the floors were in 67s which is pretty solid on the grass track up here and um, yeah that felt good it was a good mixture of a, of a workout felt like I was doing two workouts in one in a way and I was I was happy with how easy 67s were flowing and I didn't really have to chuck it into that fifth gear was absolutely cooked when I was uh, cooling down though. Average five tens, Bradley. I'd love to see you do that one day for two k only. That was uh, a struggle of a warm down. And then on Sunday, met up with Archie Reed. We did twenty five k at four oh eight pace. Um, just talking the whole way on the flat up here. And I did seven k in the afternoon for a one hundred and twenty two k week. So mm-hmm. still tick the main things off. But when you miss probably three runs. It's probably the difference between doing 160k and 120k. So, yeah, 
good, interesting week. Probably, uh, yeah, interrupted, but no dramas in the main scheme of things when people are losing their houses and businesses and lives and all those kind of things. So we did not mind leaving. And um, I think when you got a baby and stuff now too, I was like, there's no way I'm risking sitting on top of this mountain with, with one curvy road in and out for for running. It just did not make any sense. So we were we were straight out of there. Oh, no, Jared Clifford and Tim Logan, because I left half my stuff up there. They ended up uh, going into my apartment for me, gave them, their co- gave them the code, went in there, got all my luggage that I left there, loaded up their car, and then drove that down the mountain for me and met them at Mount Beauty, so that was uh, nice of them. Gave mm. them a few sticks beers to um, to say thank you. Just said to the boys, empty the fridge, boys, load up the load up the bags with the beers and you can have them. Mm. So not, not as so event- that's not bad. You got a, I mean, you got a half marathon next week, Hobart. <laughs> So. Yeah, and then the week, like I got two workouts, a 25k long run, you know, a couple of runs at altitudes, some strides. Like I've kind of nearly ticked every box. I only usually do two sessions a week anyway. It's yeah. funny how you say though, like, you know, you, with a baby and, you know, you're not going to stay up at falls. But I think this week's really put sort of things into perspective a little bit because like when it's business as usual, running is like, you know, the ma- the major priority and you've got the mileage that you want to hit. Whereas this week, I think you sort of realise that, oh, shit, there's more to life than, than running. And that's sort of, you know, the way that you're coming across now is like, uh, I, normally you'd be like a 122 shit week, but you're like, nah, in the scheme of things, it's, it's, it's all right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And like, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I'm glad Carly and the baby were there because I'm not sure if I would have left. And then, like, not that it got that close to Falls Creek or anything, but I'm kind of glad that that's in your life now and it makes it kind of makes that decision for you. Like, we were like, the minute our phones went off, we're like, we are out of here. Like, we we overreacted massively because some people didn't leave until, I think, Friday night or Saturday morning, whereas we're kind of, like, rushing down the staircase, loading the car, like I was, I was, I probably had a couple of beers at dinner and probably shouldn't have been driving down the mountain. But um, yeah, we got there in the end, and as you said, Bradley puts things into perspective. Yeah, and I hope it sort of serves as a bit of a warning for those that like to push the limits with that stuff, in terms of being a tourist, like say, and and ignoring advice mm. and just praying for the best when really they've been given advice from people that are absolutely in the know and are not just saying that as a like as being really conservative they're saying that because that's the advice that um they're professionally giving at that time for everyone to be safe and uh i like i know there's a few cases of that around where people have like no it's my holiday i'm not ruining my holiday by leaving and you're like mm-hmm. no that's a fucking bad decision yeah and i think on, because on we're the, watching the oh sorry brad you go oh just on the flips I, I totally agree with you moose but on the flip side, it's one thing, especially like when you're talking about a touristy area like the coast, it's one thing to say evacuate, but then there's nothing in place to manage people evacuating, like where it's like, okay, we'll, we'll leave Batemans Bay and we'll head up to Ulladulla. It was taking people four hours to get to Ulladulla and then they are basically being turned around because they couldn't get through there. So it's like one thing to say evacuate, but then if there's things not in place for that to actually happen, People are like, well, what's the what's the point of me evacuating then? You know, I've, I've I've spent one day trying to leave and I've had to come back. You know, yeah. do I do, do I do that again? Um, yeah. No, well, I, yeah, I guess they don't really. There's yeah, no real plan for that, is there? They're just no, because we pretty much yeah. lock a lot of the time. We, you know, you were locked in. You couldn't get out south. You couldn't get out north. But they're saying leave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's what got me was um like because we were sitting around watching the news every day saying if you were right brad and then hadn't heard from you at this time like we probably were a bit anxious and a bit on edge as well so when it kind of come to us and our phones were lighting up we're like nah i act on this one really quick and there was one line in the warning that said something like leaving immediately will will always be the safest thing to do or something like that Mm -hmm. and we're like okay we're out of here let's get down this mountain so uh don't think i picked up any red blood cells but we're all good is that what they are red blood cells think they are isn't it yep 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 let's thank some patreon supporters eh? kick us off bradley this person wrote their own description for you here have a read of this yeah so this guy's registered on patreon as asian master uh (laughs) he's uh he's in his 60s he's based in hong kong 
and he competes in Hong Kong and around Asia over 800 metres and 800 to 5,000 metres on the track and normally 5K on the road. Um, and he also noted a few things from past Inside Running podcasts. So for Brady, he's noticed that uh, Brady have a fear of meeting junkyard dogs and snakes on runs, um, which is in sync with Asian Master. He hates those things as well. Uh, <laughs> is Asian the, Master Gary Howard? <laughs> I don't think so. No, he didn't have a postal address. Oh, uh, anonymous. Let me, yeah, you keep looking. I'll search him again on Patreon here. Keep talking, right. sorry. Uh, Moose gets good points for knowing Rod McKinney's claim to fame. First first Australian under 220. Yep, and then he's uh, written, what is it, Selamat. Selamat and Tukia. Yeah, what's that mean? Uh, I think that's like congratulations. Oh, okay. congratulations to me or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and for me, he says that I should hang in there uh, to collect some kudos and prize money that he's on offer for the over 40 years big dogs. So he's, uh, yeah, so maybe, there, uh, yep. So maybe I'll uh, try and get fit for September <laughs> when, yeah, I'll be, well. when I turn 40 or well, end of August. No postal address, but I've got a we- I've got a we- uh, an email address here. That, uh, Asian Master at Gmail. No. Gary Howard email. Uh, probably might not say it here, but it ends in um, dot hk. Oh. Well, that sounds like Hong Kong, doesn't uh, it? Could yep. be. Could be legit. Well, thanks. thank you, Asian. Thanks, Asian Master, for your support. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Moose, who you got? Another international. I have Andrea Castelnovo. Andrea, I think it is. It's a man. Oh, Andrea. Andrea? It's a man, Andrea, is it? Andrea? Andrea. Andrea. From Italy. That lives in Barcelona. Isn't it? Spelt like Andrea. Anyway, he, he lives in Barcelona, but he's from Como in Italy. Beautiful part of the world. Very nice lake. George Clooney has a house there. He studied international business at... Harlan University of Technology. We sent him an inside running podcast, Steigen Singlet. Ah, so you'll expect to see that in three more months. <laughs> Even the Australian, actually on this, the Australian singlets will get there. The Australian post at the moment is not real efficient. Um, 5K, 1752, 10K, 3625, half marathoner, 120. And he's run 256 for his marathon. So another sub three hour guy watching. At the Zaragoza Marathon. How good's the name oh. of that place over in Spain? Zaragoza. Zaragoza. Yeah, Rolls off the tongue. Zaragoza. I want to thank Barry Kerry. He's uh, got some good PBs, some quick times. He's ran 16.36 for our 5K, 33.22, the Lakeside 10K this year. Uh, 118 at the Burnley Half Marathon this year and 326 at the Melbourne Marathon back in 2014. I reckon Barry's done a bit of training since then and would absolutely destroy that uh, marathon PB of 326. He's a plumber by trade. And I'm pretty sure he's real good mates with Harry Summers, if I've got the yeah. right guy. Barry, you know Barry? Yeah, he is. Yeah, oh, yeah. he's definitely uh, good mates with Harry. Yeah. So. Beautiful boys. Hey, uh, thanks to all those patrons, all their support over the uh, over the years, over the weeks. We really appreciate helping us bring the show out every week. Hey, uh, running news, real light on. The only thing I've got is the Port Sea Twilight Eight K. Friend of the show, Jordan Williams got the win in twenty two thirteen. His uh, partner in Sarah Sarah Billings, she won the women's in twenty four thirty six. You guys got anything else? Uh, well, if we're going to do fun runs, then there are lots of other fun runs too. Well, you see that Athletics Australia put this fun run on their um, on their like Instagram account. I've never seen like Athletics Australia mm. put, put a fun run on their uh, yeah, like their social media and stuff before. Surely, uh, yeah. inside inside running deserves a mention for winning uh, Steigen hashtag one. Then, yeah, I don't think they did any posts at all about Steigen at all because it was organised like outside of Athletics Australia. Well, was so was the Port Sea race organized? Is that an AA race? Well, I did some no, I did some digging around today, and it's Sole Motive who owns like run um run Melbourne and stuff as well. So, yeah, I, could, I couldn't work it out. Individual athlete, that's what it is. Oh, because there's big dogs racing there. You reckon Moose, Sarah yeah, Billings, perhaps, Jordan like, Williams? Oh well, so Ali or Sinead might have got shout outs for their good runs in New York, that kind of thing, because they don't organize New York Marathon, but they still might. 
make a shout out to it. Don't know if I'd put hey, it, is that, it uh, in the same as Portsy Twilight 8K. Is that Portsy Twilight Run actually 8K? Oh. They're pretty quick times. There, there aren't a lot of um, there aren't a lot of fun runs around that match the distance anymore. Unfortunately, people take shortcuts. I've learnt this the hard way. <laughs> Running <guys. laughs> Uh, yeah. Yeah, the news moves. You're going to tell oh, us Dawn about some more fun it runs? was Dawn Bells, Bash. Um, they are the two main ones down the coast. There was that one in Fairhaven. There was the Rue Run. Shitloads, mate. But they're not worth talking about. <laughs> just, just say them anyway. All right, Brad, just the question <laughs> then. It is a slow oh. week, though. There's not much happens this time of the year, race-wise. Yeah, we might even get through two listener questions. We'll see how we go. Yeah, that's why I put uh, two in there. Oh, actually, before we move on, someone did ask about our training weeks, what shoes we're training in at the moment. I put that up in the weekly recaps up there. Oh, yeah. There. I've got Just, a good lineup at the moment. Yeah, I've, well, mine's pretty standard. Just maybe, so the last week, Brad, this might work real well for you because you haven't been doing workouts and stuff, but maybe Moose kick us off. What, um, like the last run and week, what shoes did you wear for what da- like for what sessions and stuff? All right. So for the easy runs, I ran in the New Balance 1080 V10, the Saucony Triumph, uh, oh shit, what is it, 17, the Asics Nimbus Light, which is a new shoe. They're the three shoes that I jogged in this week. I did, a, I did my sort of surge work in the New Balance Fuel Cell Rebel, and I did my threshold work and my 1K repeats in the next percent. Oh, the next percent for workouts. Well, I got a pair that's like got got raced in already a few times, so it's ready to uh, it's ready to transition to a road shoe. Yeah. And we we actually still have a few pairs of the Ekkerd next percent left. So if you're after a pair of next percents for your next race, send us a message. Didn't sell as good as you thought they might have. Ah, they're going real well. It's just we ended up with a few more. So, yeah, we uh, we post for free, actually. So if you're in Queensland and you're wondering, hey, shit, I need a pair of these bad boys, well, send us a message yeah, mattress, wherever you're at. Mattress was chasing a pair today when I was talking to him, actually, or yesterday. Yeah, what size is his foot? Small, too. Yeah, I don't know, but he said he, was, he tried to get them online, but gone. Too Why quick. would you support? So, all right, here he, we go. He, he might not have known that you post them. Here we go. Early. Mattress is a great guy. I know he's a legend and he's bought stuff from me before. We we love it. But this is a this is something that people don't know about Nike, right? So when you go to the Nike.com.au website, so you would assume that's an Australian branch of the company, right? It comes from the Netherlands, doesn't it? Not the case, exactly. So you're buying from overseas. It circumvents anything in Australia. So the staff in Australia don't get any piece of that pie. There's no taxes being paid. There's nothing. There's no benefit as an Australian to purchase that for the economy in Australia. Um, and you're waiting long delays. Like I know people that have waited two weeks for product to come from the Nike website. It's it's mm-hmm. just like it's not the Nike Australia website. It's, we we need to understand that. Yeah. And and it's if you want a shoe, just send us a message. We post the shit for free. You'll have it in two days. Yeah. Do you end up holding a pair for me? Yeah, I got a pair for yeah. you. I'm waiting for you to pay. Perfect. I nearly sold them. You've yeah. got to be getting quick. You haven't sent. Oh, do you send an invoice for that, or just pay over the phone or something? No, I'm waiting for you. All right. I'm anyway. running in. Um, I'm running the Nike Peg Turbos at the moment, and I am jogging in those, and I'm alternating those between a pair of. Uh, Adidas Boost 20s, the NASA ones, good looking shoe as well. Um, using those for like my shorter runs. Haven't I haven't probably jogged in them longer than 35 minutes at the moment. They're kind of uh, my 8K second run pair, just because I haven't worn them in the past. So um, so far so good. Not as spongy as the Nike Peg Turbos, but still still all right, liking them and doing workouts in an old pair of um, my Lake Biwa marathon shoes. Actually, the Fly Knit Four Percenters. And doing some track work on the grass in an old pair of streaks, which is uh, that's my lineup at the moment. Four pairs, not as many as you, Moose. Brad, what are you wearing? Uh, I covered my thirty odd k in peg thirty fives. Uh, yep, during the week and thongs from the house to the beach. And the only shoes I've been wearing. Unless you're like trying to save a house, then you'll put shoes. Ufos, you in the Ufos? Yep, I took them down the coast. 
Yeah. The, uh, the four percenter of thongs. Yeah. Hey, that was my joke. That's, I was going to use that no, next no, week no, on the show when we review it's, them. It's exactly what they felt like when you put them on. Uh, yeah. We'll yeah. talk about them next week. Uh, listen to question, Brad. Let's go. Sorry. All right. First one now is in, uh, it's coming from Peter Reynolds. Uh, hi, guys. Love the show. Uh, and as I live in Castle, Maine, it's got a, a local flavor to it. I have a listener question on shoes. How often do you guys wear trail-specific shoes as you do a fair bit of training on dirt roads and trails? I'm assuming all of your runs have a bit of tarmac at the start and end. When do you choose trail shoes over regular running shoes? Cheers, Pete. Um, well, I'll kick this one off. I've never owned a pair of trail shoes in my life. So, although I run on trails, they're um, they're uh, they're, I guess, fire roads. So they're pretty. Uh, yeah, you can run. Yeah, you can run in normal sh- normal training shoes on, on those. So never never owned a pair of trail shoes. Can you Moose maybe explain the difference between trail shoes and like the other shoes we're running, like the Peg Turbos or Adidas Boost Twenties yeah. or whatever you said, like Saucony Triumphs? Well, new tri- trail shoes are a relatively new f- phenomenon, really. They've got big with the boom of the trail running scene, and uh, you're right, Brad. Like people would just wear road shoes, and but they would still run in the bush, but they never called themselves a trail runner, and they never. Um, considered it any different really to running on the road but now there's a whole industry around trail running and you've got groups like that have set up as trail runners because they run in the bush all the time but um the difference between a a road shoe and a trail shoe well there's a few underneath the like the obvious thing is the um the tread so when you've got a trail shoe there's there's a lugged sole with normally a harder rubber and a stickier rubber and the lugs are shaped differently. So when you're going uphill or on the flat, you you, you bite in and you don't slip forward or or, or backwards. And then the, the heel of the shoe or the rear foot, they're shaped the, the other way. So when you're going down a hill, you don't slip out onto your bum. Um, they tend to be a little harder wearing under there in terms of like being on rocks and that kind of thing. And uh, the soles normally are firmer, like the foams are firmer because that gives a bit more stability when you're on technical terrain. If you take your real soft road shoe out and you go down a technical descent, you might feel really unstable, higher chance of rolling your ankle. <clears throat> so the midsole is normally a, a higher density, very often neutral shoes for trail shoes. So some people wear support shoes when they run on the road and that's because it's like a p- really repetitive um, activity and there's repetitive loading that way. But if you're on a trail, every footstep's different to like to the one before it. And so there's less use of those kind of overuse injuries. And so you, you worry less about the foot sort of or pronation be, be causing a drama and, and more about stability in the shoe. So they, a neutral base is better. It doesn't um, – you're not as prone to, to the foot rolling outwards in a neutral shoe. The uppers are tougher – so less tearing, the shoe should last longer. It, l- it lets less uh, grit in- into the shoe through the mesh and holds your foot on the platform more. So if you go down a really steep descent or you're on a quite a, a bermy cambered surface and you're in your road shoe, really flexible meshes, your foot mm. isn't held on the on the platform very well, whereas a, as a trail shoe, more rigidity, and you feel like you're you're more contained in the shoe, so you get more confidence when you when you're descending or or when you're off camber. Yeah, I do right. own a pair. When I was down in Hobart a couple of years ago, Andy Allison was working for the Running Edge, and they had some on sale, so I bought a pair. But I think I've only worn them once, just a bit too. What, what are they? Uh, New Balances. Oh, the Hero. I uh, couldn't tell you. Couldn't tell you. They uh, got to be yellow on the bottom, orange. They're a good shoe, but yeah. I just have no reason to wear them because everything's like just dirt roads, like not so rocky or anything. So, yeah. Moose, you run on trails a lot. At what point would you suggest you'd have to go from a road shoe to a trail shoe to, I don't know, like see some benefit? Because like, you yeah. do most of your running in, in road shoes, don't you? Yeah, I do most yeah. of it. Um, so if I was spending more than 50% of my time on a single track... I would probably put trail shoes on. If I'm on a fire road that's well groomed, it'll be a road shoe. If um, 
if the if it's really wet, I might even put a, a trail shoe on for wet dirt roads if they're kind of muddy. Mm, hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah, yeah, because I was yeah. slipping around a bit this morning just on my trails um, because it had rained overnight. I probably should have worn those trail shoes. Yeah, you get. It. I don't know what trail shoe they are, but <clears throat> there used to be a real stigma about trail shoes being heavy and clunky, and and they and they were really like they they were an afterthought for shoe companies, and and now there's a lot of focus that gets put on them and they're, they're actually quite nice running shoes. Like there's a bunch in, in our store that I would love to, to run in. And I like, they're fun, fun shoes. They're a second shoe for someone. They're sh- not normally someone's first shoe. So, uh, but what people make the mistake of, we see it all the time is they come in and they're like, you know, I saw this shoe. It's got the best grip. And you're like, yeah, well, it's pretty narrow. No, no, it's got the best grip. My mate wears it. He doesn't slip anywhere, rah, 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 so I want to try that. You're like, you've got a wide foot, and this is a narrow shoe. The, the grip doesn't mean shit when your foot gets sore after 10 minutes. So people people focus on features in the shoe without ah. actually concentrating on how the shoe fits. Hey, grip and they make this, everything. Yeah, and then they blame the shoe. Oh, that's a shit shoe. It's terrible. You're like, no, you just fucking picked it because the lugs are deep, not because it fits your foot or you, you like the feel of it. It's... People do that with trail shoes more than any other type of shoe. Mm-hmm. Good answer. I feel like I've learned something there, Bradley. Yeah, it was good. Um, would reckon put Laura's on for next week because we've still got a bit to get through tonight. You're the boss. I think so. Uh, Moose on the loose. Oh, shit. Uh, yeah. Just did it, didn't you? <laughs> shoe tip. Fuck, yeah. yeah. Good. I thought it was having a crack at people that don't buy local. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not having a crack at that. I'm just saying, like, there's no difference in price. Why wouldn't you yeah. get it local? I know, but the tone of your voice is very moose on the loose. So I just thought okay. you could almost pass. You could, that could almost pass. Mm, let's, could almost. Let's, let's pass it. All right. There's a bit coming up. Well, I've got to go Hobart Marathon first, Brad, because you and I are going down there this weekend. Yeah. Both, both our names my... on the elite start list. Yeah, well, I only entered actually today, and I wasn't even sure what event I was going to enter. But um, luckily, the event that I've entered in is the one that put me on the start list for. That's good. <laughs> the half. There's a marathon, there's a half, there's a 10K, no elite start list for the 10K. A uh, big name on this start list is probably Millie Clark in the half marathon. Waiting to see what Millie's going to do on the way to uh, possibly qualifying for Tokyo. So this might tell us a bit. She'd be going into the uh, half marathon as the red hot favourite. She'll probably, uh, the press release I read today, she'll break the course record, which is I think 74 minutes. Uh, she'll win a bit of cash down there. Uh, Benny Saint on the pacing duties in the marathon. That's interesting. Pacing his fiance Katie, who's going for mm-hmm. a Olympic qualifiers trial time. Two forty five, I think, for females in the states. I got that right. Two forty eight, two forty five. Not know. sure. Uh, wait, what was that? Sorry. What time do the women have to run in the in the states to go to their trials? Two forty five. Oh, uh, yeah, I think it's about that. Yeah. Two forty six, something like that. Uh, Miriam Dowley's on there, Kristen Malloy, um, Paige Gilchrist, men's race, Michael Marantelli, patron supporter, Nick Earl, Brian Lyons, Adam Bishop, uh, Ben St. Lawrence is there, but he's pacing, so I'd say Nick Earl might pick up that one pretty easy, boys. Any, uh, any comments about that? Um, just a tempo for him? Train and run, just wants to break 220 and pick up some cash, I think. I think you get a bit of extra cash if you go under 220. Yeah, well, that's what he'll be there for. That's what he told me last week. Just do an easy 219. They spelled my name wrong here, Brad, as well, on this one. Trail fell. Trail full. Mm. Didn't uh, pick that up. Brad Brady trail full. Brad Croker, Dave Ridley, Tom Middleton. Is this ordered there. in terms of rankings? Yeah, I don't know. Nah, Look, Dave, shouldn't be. Dave Ridley's quicker than me. So is Brad Croker. Ridley's going to World Cross. World half, you mean? I mean, world half. Sorry, I uh, yeah. I can confirm red that I will not favorite. be finishing. Uh, <laughs> I won't be finishing that high up. Dave Ridley, red hot favourite with that sixty five. I reckon he's the man to beat. Uh, I reckon you're the man to beat, Brady. His PB is like forty five seconds quicker than me over a half. Yeah, but look at the form you're in. Yeah, true. I'm looking forward to racing. I think it's been a month since Adipec this weekend. Looking forward to getting back on the line, towing it down there. See if I can run a 65, something be nice, Bradley. Get in the 65s, see what happens. A uh, whole lot of bushfire fundraisers running related I'm going to talk about here. Dave McNeil, 
He's uh, done a post yesterday, donate one dollar for every kilometre you run this week. And it's gone. Everyone I've seen on Instagram and Strava, it's gone everywhere the last 24 wow. hours. Yeah, pretty good, isn't it? Dave McNeil, smart guy, kind guy, generous guy, good thinking guy to come up with this idea. Because it's not a huge amount of money, but if a lot of people can do this, um, it's going to contribute fantastically to the fundraising efforts for these Australian bushfires. So I've signed us three up, boys. We're going to do it. We should be able to, you know, maybe do three by 150k weeks. Brad, you'll be right for that. Yeah, so I was, I was thinking about this because I'm not sure how much I'm actually going to run this week with the conditions oh, here. Yeah. But I was, think, I was thinking that on the 1st of December, I ran down... I ran down on Runningford Road. I did 28k as my long run with Matt Johnson, who was actually um, he was evacuated out of Browley and had to spend a night at the evacuation centre. And Andrew McGow. And so I thought what I would do is maybe donate a dollar for every kilometre that I've run from that point up until now, which uh, I think is 210. Well, good so, work. Yeah, because yeah, I, I won't run a lot this week. So yeah. Moose will come close to 200k this week. The rate you're going. Yeah, I'm going to aim for a big week, so hopefully that gets up there. Any listeners out there, definitely uh, get on board that. Uh, Samantha Gash also hit us up this morning. She's, uh, what's the best way to describe her moose? Trail Ultra? She was on the Rich Roll podcast. She's like a massive name in the trail world, isn't she? Influencer. Influencer. Keynote speaker. Uh, She's organising a virtual half marathon, $50 entry. All money goes to the Red Cross. It's going to happen on the weekend of January the 17th, 18th. We'll put some uh, links in the show notes there as well. And a whole lot of race directors from the Victorian trail running scene have got together uh, to come up with a bit of a raffle. So you pretty much buy a raffle ticket and there's over 30 races in a prize pool. So if you get pulled out, I think uh, maybe first prize is maybe five entries of your choice. And then it goes down different uh, different places, different amount of races you can get into for free. So heaps of cool things going on in the running community. If that's one thing I've learned this last couple of days is how people kind of stick together and help out their mates and stuff, which is pretty cool. Anything else, yeah, anything else cool. coming up, Moose? What's going on in your life down in Ballarat for the next week? Uh, I mean, the, the highlight will be the shooting of the movie begins this week. So we'll be... Um, I'll be on set for the sh- the shooting of the movie, which will be pretty cool in Geelong and and Ballarat. Actually, one of the guys that that plays the Greek fellow who comes like third or something in the race, Joel Tobin White, actor, yeah. runner. Yeah, like has he got heaps of lines and stuff, like bigger role. Nah, nah, but he's in a lot of running scenes. He gets passed up Heartbreak Hill. Like this Korean guy buries him up the hill, so he's going to have to put on a bit of a show for that. When are you going to How- when do you go to film? No, I'm not going to Bendigo. Oh, don't do that stuff. Uh, Half of Falls Creek's in Bendigo at the moment, training. No, they're down the coast. They should have gone down the coast. That's where the oh, training's at right I think now. Most of them in Falls Creek. Bats are recruiting hard down there. <laughs> For a Div 2 win. Yep, Div 2. Heard it here first. <laughs> um, oh, that's pretty exciting stuff then. That'd be good. Oh, it'll be interesting. Seen the cast list too, haven't you? Any other big names? No, no other big names. Joel Tobin White, he hasn't done much running, has he, recently? Is he back training? Yeah, apparently he's back going all right. Back going. So, yep, he'll be um, – the problem will be, like, for a bloke like him who's a mm. professional runner, is, like, long days of shooting can mean really tiring, fatiguing stuff for an actor who has to physically exert themselves like that, especially running up a hill all fucking day. And it could, it's going to be hot, and there's, like – they're wearing these canvas shoes. Yeah, it's not ideal, but apparently well compensated. Hey, uh, how many days are they filming for, though? Um, I think I just saw the final thing. Hold on. I think he's scheduled for like, oh, uh, hold on one second. I'll Pro- tell you. Pro- in. He'll have to tell me all this stuff. And while you're finding that out, Moose, I want to know now that you've scouted the places, what do you, what do you, what do you need it for? Oh, mate, I didn't do anything when I, was, I literally didn't do a thing. So what, are you, what, are you, what are you doing? Are you giving him, like, giving the runners technique advice, or he no? I think I'm there to make sure they don't advice. cook them. They're real worried about OH and S having them run up a hill like when it's thirty degrees oh. all day. They're really worried about it. Yeah, like, I think it's a big deal. They, they obviously didn't listen to the, the episode a couple of weeks ago where you cooked Brady. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I haven't done anything good since then. A single thing yet. Not how a single are, thing. How are you qualified to make that call? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I'm not. I don't. I literally have had no impact. No one asked me. I just kind of hide. I'm the grey man. I just. I've just hidden at the back, and um, the Koreans have it all sorted. I just like. I don't know. As if Moose is going to say no to money, though. Yeah. Oh, I don't even know. No, it's not like that. I just want to get my name on a screen. <laughs> Credits. In Vietnamese. The, in the credit. <laughs> I wonder what my name in Vietnamese looks like. Mate, you got your name on a running singlet. Oh, it's been good, too. It's sold out. The Steiger ones. Yeah, yeah, the Steiger ones. Done. Oh, that's nice. They went well. Yeah, good. Yeah. Keep the same uniform next year or change it up, you reckon? Change it up. Mm. Change it. I'm looking forward Not to seeing it. Have you got yours, Brady? Yeah, I got mine. It was here when I got home from Falls Creek. Mum was house sitting. She collected it for me, which was nice. Mum's still here, though. I haven't got rid of her. I told her she was going to be here for two weeks, and then she thinks she's still staying for two weeks. Yeah. Did, you, did it fit? A uh, bit small? I haven't put it on yet. Yeah. I was thinking about racing in it, but then I'm like, yeah, racing a single with your own name on it. I'm like, <laughs> Well, Nick Earl races with fucking shorts with his own name on it. Yeah, this is a bit of a difference between Nick, Nick Earl and I. What's the difference? Ah, uh, swagger. That's the difference. Yeah, true. Um, true. Interview boys, Jared Clifford, caught up with him a couple of uh, weeks ago and yeah, sp- said his name a few times here. Jared and I had done a podcast episode like years ago when I was doing Tell Me Your Tales, so didn't talk about any of that, like how he got into running, to go through his kind of whole biography, more just current stuff. Um, yeah, you've heard his name a couple of times tonight. Obviously, coming off that double gold medal at the World Para Championships, talk about all the logistics about, you know, Tim Logan's role and how they do that swap with the the band and mm. yeah, how they prepare for all that stuff. Jared's always got some good input about you know the state of athletics and especially para athletics and um, yeah, gearing up for a big Tokyo. This guy could yeah well and truly win a couple of gold medals at the uh, Paralympics coming up in like six months' time. So uh, enjoy this chat with him, and we'll see you guys next week. See you, boys. In Hobart, Brady. Yeah. Hey, are we on the same flight or not? Good luck. No, but we arrive similar time. Okay. So you're not on the same flight as me from Melbourne? No. I don't think so. I don't think so. Are you Qantas? Nah, mate. Jetstar. Pockets aren't as deep as yours. We're different. We don't have Jetstar from Canberra. All right. See you, boys. Yeah. All right, this week on the Inside Running Podcast, I'm joined with uh, Jared Clifford, who's just fresh off his two gold medals at the World Para Championships over in Dubai. Thanks for uh, coming on the Inside Running Podcast, Jared. What's been happening? Thanks for having me on. I, I got back on Friday from being overseas, so I'm just settling back into day-to-day life. But yeah, I've been a long-time listener of the show, so it's it's good to be on. And I was just saying off-air to you that we will let listeners know that Jared and I have uh, done a podcast together before on my other podcast, Tell Me Your Tales. Um, that was September 14th, 2017. So if you want to go back and hear about how Jared got into the sport, um, his kind of achievements up until that stage, definitely go back and check that out for a bit of context because we're going to talk about Jared in uh, 2019 in this conversation. But yeah, definitely check that one out if you want. And um, where have you been, Jared? We just said you're back to Australia. Where uh, where have you been traveling? Yeah, so uh, we were in Flagstaff for the first month, just training, and then had a training camp in Barcelona before heading to Dubai for the World Championships. And then I uh, decided to uh, take a little bit of a, a mental break from, from the training before we get into Tokyo. Uh, and so I went to uh, London, Paris, and Edinburgh. So I've, I've been uh, to quite a bit of the world. Has this, uh, after the World Champs, this been a bit of a party kind of trip or you just been chilling out, like any running involved at all? Uh, we had a, a big night or two in, in Dubai, but uh, just mainly just chilling out really, uh, not too much partying and it was a big lead into the to the championship, so I was pretty pretty tired and just like the pressure and, and everything can get to you after a while, so it was good to just kick back and relax. 
Beautiful, mate. Well, I'm going to read through your PBs. Tell me if I get these ones correct, and then yeah. we might exp- explain to the listeners like your classification because I've got a couple of questions around that as well, and just kind of uh, yeah. how some of the some of the things you've got to deal with when you're competing. So, eight hundred one fifty three. Yep. Okay. Uh, Fifteen hundred three forty five in Sydney. Yeah, yeah. So there's that's the one that there's a bit of contention about because obviously. Um, my win at World Champs was a, a couple of seconds slower, but that's the world record. So yeah, I was going to um, ask that because that one's got you listed as like a T twelve world record, but then your world record at World Champs, the three forty seven, was like T thirteen. Yeah, so that's. I mean, when we get to classification, I can clear that up. But uh, some races just aren't ratified for some reason, and, and some are. So uh, I've run under that time, I think, a dozen times, but none of them have, have counted. Yeah, okay. We'll talk a bit more about that later on. Uh, a mile in 4.09, 3K in 8.15. That's that's correct? Yeah, that that was a while ago, but yeah. Yeah, I still claim it. Uh, fi- <laughs> 5K in 14.22. Yeah. Uh, 10K on the road, 29.44 at Albert Park this year in a windy... On a windy day, I remember that one because I was with you for the first couple of K, which is super impressive, that uh, 29.44. Yeah, that's got to be one of my oh, favourite PBs, I think, definitely. And I did some digging around for your half marathon today, and is it 70.47 as maybe a training run at Burnley half marathon? Yeah, that was this year, just to you know get out in the club colours. Get some points for uh, Diamond Valley. Yeah, oh, I love getting out in the club colours. I did quite a lot of the races, or as many as I could get to this year, so it's um, always good fun. Yeah, so now can you maybe explain to us like what your classification is and what it actually means? Like is it juvenile macular degeneration? Yeah, so that's my condition. I was diagnosed when I was three, so um, I have trouble seeing in the central part of my vision, so my perception of detail um, is is what I struggle with. So uh, stuff like facial features or or anything like that um, is really hard for me to pick up on. So there's three visual impairment categories t11 t12 and t13 and t11 is totally blind that's pretty easy to classify and then t12 and t13 are vision impaired so there's still some useful sight and for distance running because we don't have to run in lanes they combine 12 and 13 so it's pretty pretty simple for distance running there's just like a totally blind category and then a vision impaired category Okay, so is that why you've moved from like T12 to T- T13 because your eyesight's like deteriorated a bit? Um, so T12 is actually worse. Uh, so I've always been T12, but at international level, uh, they just combine the two categories. So it comes under the heading of T13. So um, that's that's why there's all that confusion with the records because uh, more, some for some reason I think it's just coincidence. T12s tend to actually run quicker than 10.13s with the record. So instead of just combining the world record, they have um, they have separate ones for some reason, despite the fact that we compete together internationally. Yeah, yeah, that's good to clear that up. And, like, explain to me what can you see when you're competing? Maybe on the track first, because I want to then talk to you about, like, what it's like on the road and cross-country as well. I'm sure it's a bit different. Yeah, so track's obviously quite a lot easier because... 100 meter straights, 100 meter bends, it's always the same. The difficulty is running in a pack. So I still run the 1500 solo. So pretty much I can see the person in front in terms of where they are and their movement and, and stuff like that. But in terms of seeing the bibs or who they are or anything beyond that person, um, it's pretty much impossible. So quite often I won't have a clue what place I'm coming in a race or how fast I'm going or or anything like that, and and uh, in different conditions, when it's darker, uh, it's you know even hard to see the feet in front of me to avoid clipping them. So uh, a lot of the time, it feels like I'm running into an unknown kind of abyss-ish kind of thing. Um, but you can, I also use my ears so I can hear the person in front as well, which then I can gauge where I am. So, so are there races when you cross the line and you're not actually sure what position you're finished in? Oh, most of the time, yeah, right. really. Um, unless I've been at the front of the race from the start, uh, and then I can just know if someone's passed me, uh, I usually wouldn't, won't have a clue. 
And do you think it's sometimes a good thing? Like not knowing sometimes can help you out because it doesn't like get in your head as much. Like you could be sitting next to Luke Matthews or Ryan Gregson, and I'm sure you have been in some of these national races, and it's not like you're psyched out because they're you know three thirty kind of uh, low guys. Oh, I think it helps a lot of the time because the other thing is once the person in front of me gets a couple of meters ahead, I don't know how far ahead they've they've got. So if I can't see anyone with a lap to go, and I know there's people out there. I'm probably going to fight all the way to the line just in case I do catch them, even if in reality they're pulling away because I just I just don't know. So it kind of helps you to never give up, I think, in the race. Um, and, yeah, I think I think just being a, a Paralympian and a para-athlete, it's kind of like that inevitable underdog label. So whenever I'm in a national final next to people like, you know, a Luke Matthews and, and a Ryan Gregson, it's, it kind of feels like I've got nothing to lose and I'm just going out there and, and giving it a crack mm, well put and then like tell me what's it like i was tracking you a bit at the uh bandura 10k cross country race this year like, what's it what's it like in that race there's a funny story to that i was just supposed to uh jog around and uh get points for the club but my training partner and guide tim logan uh pretty much told me to stop being soft and to have a crack and um so i the plan was that i would sit sit on his tail and and i'd just follow him throughout the whole race and you know hopefully i could just get around safely by by watching his footsteps and stuff but he's uh he's quite fit so he dropped me after about 4k and i was on my own so um that was really difficult uh i think i ran out of the flags heaps of times i um i pretty much hip and shouldered one of the officials and um it was probably not the best thing for me to do in terms of uh, the risk that it was giving me but I love cross country I love getting out there and um, I don't know it's just like so such a pure form of running so I think for me getting out there and doing that is sometimes more important than you know always being wrapped up in cotton wool and just running on the track but uh, in terms of its difficulty uh, I think the adrenaline was what got me through it and also the people out there like with 400 to go I caught Liam Cashin uh, from Western Athletics, and and he pretty much guided me around the last corner. Which you know, it's still a race; it's a state title. Like they, they don't have to do that. And and I'm just lucky that in Victoria, I've got you know such good support. Mm. Yeah, you fit in pretty well in Victoria with that kind of like. There's a massive group of youngsters. Like you're 20 years, is that right? Yeah, there's such a good group. And like, it's almost like there's a no fear kind of attitude as well amongst all of them like Liam Cashin you just mentioned and like Cody Shanahan and like all these guys are just having a crack I know we spoke on the podcast a couple of times giving Brad a bit of shit about um like just how strong our kind of those junior kids are down here that are now in the open ranks oh yeah I think that's something that Victoria is really good with and and the cross country season I think is what builds that because you know people like Cody and Liam I've grown up racing them for years and, and I think uh, we've always been the youngest in the races and we've just fed off each other. You know, one of us will, will have a crack against the big guys and do really well and that'll, you know, feed the belief that, you know, I can do that or, or the, another person can do that. And I think that no fear is just a thing that a runner needs to have and, and I think if we have fear, uh, we won't get as far as we probably should be getting. Yeah, well put. And, um, like, you obviously used that winter season with the Albert Park 10K, and I know you ran Gels Park Relays and Sandown Relays, both of those with a guide as a bit of a base-building thing for um, before you went over to Flagstaff. Yeah, yeah. It's the first time that I've spent the entire winter in Australia since I was, I think, 15 or 16, just because I'm always travelling overseas for a championship so with the championship being so late it actually gave me my first full winter so building a base um for the first time really in my career uh was was really beneficial and also getting the guiding practice like um although harry summers and and jack Eater from diamond valley weren't going to guide me at dubai it was still practice and and at albert park uh, i couldn't manage to get a guide because it's such a good race they all want to run it themselves understandably so i had a guy on a bike but just listening to the instructions and, and trying to tune out um, from stressing about stuff was really good practice for Dubai and I think they played a pretty pivotal role. 
And did you have that kind of time in mind at Albert Park, like the 29.44? And like that's a tough course for someone who has trouble with their vision to go around the cones. That's probably, what, four or five times you've got to do U-turns on that course. Yeah, so I think... I think if you're in that ballpark, you're kind of always aiming for sub 30. Whether or not you think it's actually possible is another question. And, and in hindsight, I, I have no idea what I was thinking. But that course is interesting because once you get around those turnarounds, I just thought it was you know out and back, pretty pretty easy, not many obstacles. But the corner is such a slow trajectory um, around, like it curves around the the lake. Um, the the guy on the bike was having to yeah tell me to take a step to the side every now and then just because i i wasn't quite predicting the trajectory the same but with the turnarounds uh we were just counting it in so 100 50 20 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 and at one that's when i turn and i think we only i only hit one of the cones once um which is which is pretty good i think the guy on the bike used to do rally car driving or something like that the navigation um not i think someone told me that so it was. I was in pretty safe hands. Who uh, organises that? Like, do you find him yourself, or like, does someone put you in touch? And like, obviously, I didn't realise. I thought it was just a, an athlete's Victoria official kind of on the bike helping out for the morning. But it sounds like he was pretty qualified to do that job. Well, I have a, uh, a pretty loose partnership with Crosby Crew, and I, I really like everyone down there. And, and Tim Crosby has helped me out quite a lot throughout my career. So I just asked him if he knew anyone that you know, would be suitable in it. And, um, you know, Tim Crosby knows quite a lot of people. So I think he just picked the, the best qualified person that, that wasn't planning on racing that day, which was, which was him. So it was so good to have him by my side. And I'd only met him on the morning of the race. And usually I feel like I have to trust the person mm. with my life, but he instilled that in me pretty, pretty much straight away. So I was, you know, quite trusting of him. Beautiful. So you wrap up, um, you know, the winter season for Athletics Victoria, head to Flagstaff. How many weeks were you over there for? It was pretty much a month, so it was my longest stint by a few days up there, uh, and the first time, you know, that was my third time going, so it was my first time where I really felt like I adjusted quick enough and was able to train to my full potential up there. Yeah, what's it like as a, as a place to visit? Like, there's a bit more going on in Flagstaff than some training uh, al- or altitude centres, isn't there? Like, places to go? Yeah. I haven't been to a lot of other places, but... I think, you know, Philo, through his work, has been to pretty much every altitude training uh, place in the whole world, and, and he swears by Flagstaff. It's a it's a big, it's nearly a small city, like it's a pretty big town, and there's heaps to do. It's on a plateau, but then you can also get hills within 10 minutes if you wanted that. There's so many running trails, um, whether it's single track or, or you know, a, a dirt road, and there's tracks, there's like three or four tracks as well, um, there's a really good physio- physiology lab. Um, it's the perfect place to train, and it's at 2,100 meters, which is probably the perfect altitude. But but then again, we also did runs at 2,700, and it's easy to drop down to 1,000 meters down at Sedona and Cottonwood, which both have tracks. So it's uh, you know if I was serious about a major championships now that I've been there, I probably wouldn't go anywhere else. Yeah, and like, can you explain the group that goes? Because I think you guys have been over, yeah, yeah, I think you just said three times. Like, it seems like Philo like has a group that goes over there every year. Is that like an Athletics Australia kind of group, or how does that work? Yeah, so some years we've had people that aren't coached by Philo, um, and that's worked really well. But this year, uh, obviously, there's not many people that will be going to altitude at that time of year. Um, so we just had, you know, the para group, which was uh, me, Michael Roger, Dion Kenzie, uh, Sam Harding, who's another vision impaired runner, who's just got to qualify for Tokyo. Uh, yeah, myself and and Tim, who was guiding me. Plus, uh, you know, Athletics Australia had funded um, Dane Verway to come as our physio, and uh, Millie Clark and and Keely Small, our you know kind of Olympic contenders. So our squad's growing quite a lot at the moment. Um, and yeah, when we're over there, we can pretty much now have our own group, and it's enough training partners. Mm. And you're all in like one house and stuff? They rent out a house or how does that work? Yeah, all in one house. So we were all crammed in. Uh, it's pretty big, two stories. But um, yeah, in a month, uh, yeah, it can get pretty cooped up. But Flagstaff's just so good. So you can always get away. 
Yeah, good. And then um, like you're there for four weeks and you're obviously preparing for a 1500 and a 5K. So what does training look like for those four weeks when you're up there? Yeah, so sometimes I'd be doing, you know, a session that, you know, take warm up and cool down out of it. Might only total 1200 meters or 1500 meters of work. And then the next day I'd be doing a, a session that could total up to 20 Ks of, you know, with far left in, in the middle. So uh, the training was really different, but it's also the first time I've gone to Flagstaff with a bit of pressure as well. Uh, I've always gone into championships being someone not really in contention to win, whereas this time I was going in with the mentality that to not win would be a disappointment. So you kind of really take notice of how you're feeling in every session. And, um, you know, I had a, a session where I went out too hard in a, in a speed workout and I could hardly even finish the session. And I was, uh, I was throwing up everywhere and I was, it, it's any session can derail your confidence or any session can really build it up. So by the end of it, it's nearly a fine line between what sessions are going to gain fitness or which sessions are going to, you know, build up your confidence. And are you putting that pressure on yourself or are you feeling it from other people? Um, I think it's a bit of both, but I think I focus more on the pressure that I naturally put on myself, which, you know, obviously I, I've got big goals with Tokyo and, and this is, you know, the first time I'll be racing people from my classification in two years. So Dubai was a really good chance to kind of gauge where I was at against the rest of the world and and uh, Russia was coming back into it for the first time in my career. So there was a lot of unknowns. And I think in the able-bodied running community back home, the people that would be following my journey, um, you know, they hear that I'm the world record holder and, and they hear that I want to win gold in Tokyo. But, but uh, there's a lot more to it. So, yeah, I think that's the pressure I'm putting on myself. But also medal tallies. Um, you know, I'm paid by Athletics Australia to win medals and, and – uh, there's an expectation on me to do that. So I think there's a pressure there, although they'll never really put it on me specifically. You know that's kind of um, what your job is to do. Mm, yeah, like all that funding and performance means so much for you guys. We see it all the time, like people go on and off that kind of NAS funding because of their results at recent championships. Yeah, that's right. And also the funding that the sport gets can often be dictated by how many medals uh, a one at a Paralympic Games or yeah, something like that. So, so sometimes, yeah. So sometimes, like we don't know how much it does dictate it, but I'm sure whether I win medals in Tokyo potentially will dictate, I don't know, extra bonus funding for the sport. I'm not really sure how it works, but I know that there's added pressure on on people in the staff as well. And you're a switched on and smart guy as well, and you'd realise like you winning medals brings exposure, which then brings funding, and then that's you know what I mean. Like there's a lot of expectations on your shoulders when you start thinking about all those kind of things, sponsorship and all that kind of stuff. Not just for you, but for the whole sport in general. Yeah, that's the thing. The Paralympic Games games are, are growing so quickly. I think uh, sometimes I feel as though if I can win these gold medals, because obviously I want to win them just because I, I want to, but other than that, if I win a gold medal, maybe it gives me a better platform to get the messages that I think are important. You know, it, maybe that'll help me get them across. So there's that extra pressure, and it's also with Tokyo next year. I I know that if I can win a gold medal, then the next four years will be so much more bearable, maybe, or easier to just get through, and and I'll be able to focus on on you know having ticked that box. I might be able to focus more on on a little bit of activism kind of kind of area of the sport too so there's a lot going on in my head yeah because a, an, a paralympic gold medal looks a whole lot better like not that a world champs two of those gold oh, medals yeah. isn't impressive but it's a good thing to have on the resume isn't it oh a hundred percent and i think uh that's the thing after the races in dubai that i was uh nearly nervous about uh, everyone was celebrating I was celebrating but in the back of my mind it was like those races were so perfect at world championships I, I wish just one of them had a had you know would be the race in Tokyo so um I, yeah it's kind of like it's it's you know I want to celebrate now but the turnaround's so quick and and um it doesn't really feel like the job's done at all so um yeah well, let's talk about your championship history. Like you were seventh at the Paralympics in Rio. I've got that correct, yeah? 
Yeah, yeah. And then you got the bronze medal at the World Champs in 2017 at London. So, uh, as you said, this one's kind of been coming, moving up the kind of um, the finishing order, and now to jump to the two golds and you know leading into Tokyo, it must you know as you just said had that added pressure, but it must also give you a lot of confidence knowing you're the fastest guy in the field with those world records, but also that you can perform at a championship now as well. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. I, I think I'm. Um... You know, I don't know if it's, you know. I think it is Philo's coaching as well, as well as my mentality before these races. But I've never not been able to peak for the peak that I want to. You know, whether that's once or twice a year. So my national championships and my major championships in the winter uh, overseas have always been my best races of the year. And I don't know if that's just because I can get the most out of myself when when it's on the line, or if I perform well under pressure and and Philo's periodization, but it gives me confidence every time I ace uh, what I'm aiming for for the whole year because then it, it makes it more likely that I can do it when it matters um, in Tokyo. But being the fastest going in definitely had a pressure that I, I was just learning to deal with you know, this year and, and obviously making the World Junior Championships for able-bodied last year and breaking mm. the world record also made people look to me uh, despite having never proved myself at a major championship yet. So there was... Um, a bit unknown. So now that I've done it, I think going into Tokyo, I'll be, yeah, definitely more confident. And, and uh, at least now I know that I can do it. So I've just got to do it again. How have you seen um, the para sports change over those kind of three championships? Oh, massively. I, in Doha, it was, you know, there was no crowd, uh, not much viewing. In London, which is, you know, the home of, Paralympics spectatorship. Uh, we had upwards of thirty to forty thousand people coming to a World Championships for para athletics um, on the weekend nights, and then uh, obviously Rio was was huge. But you know Tokyo, my my family might struggle to get tickets. That's how many tickets they've sold already. So um, that's awesome. And Dubai, it was on Channel Seven, um, the app live and highlights on on the actual TV and um, we're getting heaps more exposure and I think people are starting to realise that in the world we live in today where, and this is something Kurt Fernley will always say, is that we live in a world where the image of perfection is becoming so more a part of society and the Paralympics are showing that there is a lot of beauty and strength in in a perceived imperfection. So I think uh, the growth of the Paralympic Games is is going to be so good for, for the world as a whole. Yeah, and it was always after, like, the uh, London Olympics as well and Paralympics, wasn't it? Like, that was the first time. I know their marketing around that was really good and they yeah. had that YouTube video. And we probably spoke about it last time you are on the on the podcast. But um, that, for me, was a massive shift about this needs to be celebrated, not kind of turned away from. Yeah, and, and it's incredible when you go to London. They, they're Paralympians especially from 2012, are household names. And in Japan, they're making them household names before the games have even happened. So that's, you know, just just as Olympians are household names. So that that's incredible. And I think, I think uh, what, what the most powerful part of the Paralympic Games is, is to show that when sport adjusts and, and shows what people with disability can do, then community can, can adjust. And and maybe, you know, our workplace and our governments will have more people with disability because we should, yeah, we should be celebrating that human diversity and, and increasingly we are, but there's obviously a lot a lot more to do. Yeah, and like looking at those countries and what they're doing, are there certain things, I'm putting you on the spot a bit here, that you kind of look at those countries and think, oh, I wish Australia was doing this or that? Oh, I think, you know, obviously Australia would be one of the better countries in the world, but I think having the games come to the country does so much for people with disability in that country. Yeah. And so obviously they have the, you know, they have a very good excuse to be putting, you know, posters on the side of buildings with, you know, someone in a wheelchair or, or someone using a cane on an ad. Um, just little stuff like that because often you can grow up in Australia and it's changing now with people like Dylan Alcott and Madison De Rosario and, and people like that. But when I was growing up, I could easily have gone my whole childhood without hardly ever seeing someone with a, a visible disability. And I think 
to normalize it, it just has to be seen a lot more and, and people will be able to, um, cause you know, some people are scared of what they don't know. And if they don't know disability, then they'll be scared of it. So I think that's, it's, it's this first simple step is just seeing it more in society and seeing that it's, it's just another way of living and it's, you know, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, when I was uh, reading Dylan Alcott's book, he kind of spoke about the only time when he saw somebody in a wheelchair was when it might have been one of the TAC kind of car ads and someone had been yeah. in a car accident and then they're kind of saying, you know, don't drink and drive or you'll end up like this person who's in a wheelchair. And that was yeah. such a negative kind of um, way to, to show someone with a disability and that was all he was getting exposed to. So then his thinking about... You know, his kind of self-image is persuaded in this way. Yeah, and, and and that's the thing. And when I'm growing up, I'm I'm told to. Oh, I was told to hide my disability as much as I could, uh, not by my parents, but by just uh, the vision impaired school teachers. And it's not their fault at all because when vision impaired people, there's such a high unemployment rate, despite a lot of them having degrees, and that's just because. Uh, even if they look so good on paper, as soon as they walk into the meeting, often the person will change their attitude. And, and Nas Campanella, who's the uh, newsreader for Triple J, mm. she's a, a great example of that. She's one of the best journalists in Australia, and she she couldn't she got rejected by heaps of job people who'd given her an interview and, and stuff like that. So um, yeah, society needs to to shift um, quite a lot, and I think it is going in that direction. But yeah, just portraying it not as a negative thing but as something to celebrate and and um just a challenge to overcome that's i think that'd be so special yeah and i think we're on the right track now like it's still got a bit of time to to happen but i think it's the ship sailing in the correct direction yeah definitely so um back to your races we're going jumping all over the place here mate but the 1500 you go in with the quickest time you hit the front you got a russian on your shoulder and um <laughs> i was sitting on the edge of my seat i'd already knew the result but it was still pretty nerve-wracking kind of seeing you finish there and he was he was close on you quick but he just never got there yeah it, it's funny because i actually looked up their uh the russians times on their IWF profiles because they had no times registered as in the para world just because of their ban um, and it turned out they had a 147 and 148 800 PBs but I couldn't find their 1500 PBs so I had no idea how good they were going to be and when the guy went out hard I just I just sat on him but the race wasn't very quick early uh, and Philo had told me before the race to only go to the finish line like make the move only when you know you can get to the finish line without fading and so I was thinking maybe 200 or 300, but I could feel the bunch catching back up. And I think that I heard the commentator say a group of eight. So I made the move at 400 to go. And I think 50 meters into the move, I just went, oh, shit, I've gone <laughs> too early here. Um, and, yeah, rounding the bend with 100 to go, I, I heard the commentator say, um, oh, and, the, and the Russian's coming which is an ominous thing to hear in any context, I suppose. But um, to get to hold on, because I think with 50 to go, I mentally uh, thought I, I thought I was going to get caught, but obviously I kept driving to the finish line. So I think that's why I had such a big reaction at the end because um, I, I did not expect that entire lap. I've never been running with so much fear. I thought he was going to get me. There's something special about that, isn't it, though, seeing no one between you and the finish line? Like, it's uh, it's there for the yeah. taking, and you kind of find a bit extra when you have to. Yeah, and the, the, the funny thing is, like, I am obviously run hundreds and thousands of laps around track, so I usually know when I'm going to come to the end of the straight, but when you're in that moment, that straight becomes so long, yeah. and I had no idea where it was uh, until right before it, so... I was just hoping and hoping it would come a little bit quicker. Could you hear him, like his voice and stuff and footsteps? Oh, yeah. he's He was a big boy, yeah. so I could definitely – I heard his footsteps. I heard um, his breathing, and, and it was definitely closing in. So, I, um, yeah, I was pretty nervous. And, and the funny thing was his shadow kind of from the lights came straight over me, so I could see it right in front of me, um, right on the ground. So – his shadow was literally looming over me in those last steps which was pretty crazy so what does it mean i think it was yesterday or the day before like russia got banned from the tokyo olympics what does that mean in the para world yeah so this is the thing because obviously with the olympics 
uh, each sport has its own governing body. So uh, in 2016, uh, the IOC decided to leave it up to each sport and athletics opted with banning them. But in the para world, Russia was banned from the entire games um, uh, without you know any any discretion really. So then they were allowed back in this year. But uh, yeah, the news has come out in the last few days with WADA uh, deciding to ban them. So I've only read a, a statement where the Paralympic Games have acknowledged the findings, but uh, still no word on uh, what they'll do with uh, 2020. Um, but I, I suppose if it's WADA, I, I don't see what, what they can do. So it'll mm. be interesting. Might not have to race him at Tokyo. Yeah, which is funny. It's like it's weird because, yeah, obviously it might make my job easier. But yeah, am I racing the best athletes in the world? I'm not sure. The Africans always are better at the Paralympic Games. They come from Kenya and Ethiopia for the games. Sometimes not always for the world champs. So it'll be high quality either way. But it's kind of a weird feeling because um, I talk to them after the race and stuff. So it, you know, it makes you realize they're just they're just humans. But um, yeah, if, if their country is doing the wrong thing, then I suppose they've got to be banned. Yeah, and then the 5K, How was it about five or six days after? Yeah, pretty much the next week, exactly. And in the 5K, you had Coach Phil Saunders and training partner, best mate, Tim Logan, kind of pacing you for this one. So tell yeah. us about something, like are you guys doing 400 or 800 metre reps or track work at that pace, like with them, with them tied to you, guiding you? Like how do you practice for that? Yeah, we were doing a lot of stuff on the track, but uh, we found it difficult because obviously they were doing the full session as well, so they were just as tired as me, and it, it's a lot harder when both of us are tired. So we uh, decided to start doing guiding for pretty much all of our short, easy runs. Um, so we racked up a couple of hundred Ks just with the, the tether, um, and we're, we're running that closely together normally, but adding in the tether... Uh, it does make it a little bit more uh, difficult or challenging. So, um, yeah, we did that. And then we started doing drills, so high knees, um, B-skips, butt kicks, lunges, um, hopping, um, and just stayed in sync and, until it was kind of ingrained in us because we wanted to get to the point where um, the tether, like even with the tether, I still felt like I was running as if I would as freely as, as I would without, uh, so that then the communication uh, benefits would outweigh any disadvantage with the tether, which in the end uh, we did. But there were so many races where we hadn't executed it. Um, and honestly, the, fir- the first time we executed it to perfection was actually at the World Champs. That's a good, good time to get it right. Yeah. So um, just on the tether, is there a regulation like length that that has to be? Yeah, it's a, it's a good business opportunity because for this one guy in China because now the Paralympics say that you can only get it off this guy so um, they're 30 centimeters long uh, except uh, 20 centimeters of that is taken up with the loops that you put your fingers in so it's it's really only just over 10 centimeters between um, you know my hand and the guide's hand so we are pretty much running as, as one person and does it loop around like your whole hand to be a like around your wrist tighten there uh it's it's only one or two fingers um depending on on the preference there so it's it's uh it's not it's not very big at all yeah and then like it's just the logistics around like are you guys practicing when tim's or philo's arms like left arms down your right arms down as well like you have to be in sync that way yeah so we uh we uh, yeah i focus on when i put my right foot down they'll put their left foot down so that and then the arms will follow so that's usually how I do it um the hardest thing is the changeover because Tim has to uh come from behind and then get in sync with my footsteps uh whilst also making sure that he takes the rope without Philo ever dropping it because then we would get disqualified so that's the hardest because it's easy to pick up the rope um you know without getting in sync but as soon as Tim gets gets the rope, we should really be in sync straight away so as not to miss any moves or, any, or anything like that, which we actually did perfectly in the race. But in training, we made a few mistakes even two days before. So 
um, it was pretty clutch. And then there's other people, like obviously in the race as well. So, like, at what stage did Philo like finish up and Tim come into the race to swap yeah. over? So it's uh, we have to designate that before the race. So, um, say Philo was to do a hammy or something with two laps to go, I would actually have to ride it out with him um, for those two laps. So we designated 2.4 k's uh, into the race and. Um, yeah, we were still, you know, in the pack, so Philo had to navigate his way or my way through that pack to get onto the outside. Um, but the thing with that, at the start of the race, he was so good because I was all I had to do was just look at the person in front of me, and he made sure that I was always in contact with the leaders, and I I moved up when Philo thought I could move up, and um, we're not actually you're not supposed to do any verbal coaching, so we had to come up with some. Um, in terms of actually where you should be positioned, you can obviously describe stuff and, and, and whatnot. But we actually decided to come up with some kind of body language. So he, he'd, he'd pretty much just yeah either yank the rope or if I wanted to move out and go around, which happened with 300 to go, I'd just give the guy a, a big uh, shove with my elbow. So it was pretty simple, but um, it was perfect because I just trusted wherever they thought I should be in the pack I would go with them that's fascinating though isn't it it must take a lot of our self-control for Philo not to be coaching like as you coach and being right yeah. there in the pack when you've got a massive chance to win a gold medal and he's not allowed to say stuff and got to kind of keep his emotions under control as well yeah that, that's right he and he's nervous as a coach and and a guide so um yeah yeah I just can't imagine the psychology in my guides because it's totally different to mine um and i think i think the pressure on them is potentially even more because they know that uh the decisions that they make on behalf of me um could define the work that i've put in and the sacrifices i've made for four years so um there's a lot riding on them uh but they do it so perfectly and we know each other so well um yeah well, that's the. Um, I wanted to bring that point up about like Tim Logan. Like he's kind of sacrificed a lot of his season to to be a guide in a way and go yeah. to Flagstaff and um, like Tim's ran fourteen oh one. I'm pretty sure for five k. Yeah. Like this isn't a guy who's just you know doing it on the side and being your number one help out. He's actually an amazing runner himself, kind of thing. So like, do you sit down and have that conversation with him and say, I want you to do this role and it's going to require this many weeks of you know, focusing on someone else. I know he's getting fit, you know, going to flight yeah. staff and stuff like that as well. So there is some benefit for him. But at the end of the day, he's there to do this role for you. Yeah, I think if I didn't have Tim and I didn't have Philo, uh, it would be the conversations I'd have to have with people would be quite a lot different and quite a lot more formal in terms of arrangements and, and, and whatnot. But I've known Tim since I was 13 uh, and he's been for most of that time the only runner in my area that, that can keep up and and obviously Phil is my coach so he's always going to be happy to do it but uh, yeah Tim and I just yeah we've just been training partners for so long it's nearly I nearly didn't even have to ask it nearly just kind of happened because um, you know he's seen how hard I've been training and working for this since I can remember so but uh, yeah obviously there's sacrifices that he's making and, and there's benefits that he's getting too now like uh, off the back of our win in in Dubai, uh, he's can be treated as a NAS athlete now, um, so he can get support from the VIS because obviously, um, and this was this was true even before we were guiding in races. But if he's injured in training, it makes my training quite a lot harder because I have to run either around really small loops or on the track only because often when I adventure out side of those two places uh it's because he's with me so uh if he's injured um training becomes harder so i i need him pretty much the whole week um so it's he need, i need him to get the physio support and i need him to get um the even the psychological support so it's good that he's treated as an athlete now yeah, I did like as well that Athletics Australia or whoever was in charge of like the, the publicity stuff over there it was kind of like get to know this athlete and they did one on Tim as well, which I thought was yeah. really cool, like and treating him like it's part of the team and not just there for, for your thing and then, um yeah, get to share the glory a bit as well. Yeah, and that's that's – I think that's like why he's such a good mate and such a good guy because he 
embraces the fact that you know that gold medal it's not my gold medal it's a team gold medal it's a team sport so I think um yeah and I acknowledge that I can't do it without him so um and I and I made sure that the Paralympic team and the Athletics Australia team you know they knew that I couldn't do it without him so you know as soon as people realize that they embrace him as a fully fledged member of the of the Paralympics team and if he you know if we get to the the Paralympics and do the 5,000 meters Philo and Tim uh, will become Paralympic athletes so um, it's pretty special yeah and like that relationship like running such an individual sport but to have them there in the race with you and on the track and at the training camps like yeah you're in a very special situation with Michael Roger as well where it all feels like yeah. you can't get more team orientated than what you guys have built there yeah I think that's that's the special thing about about Philo's training squad and, and even beyond the para part of the squad just the whole squad in general where Philo uh, is so passionate about the sport and obviously he's still running himself and he's never asked for a cent from any of us he just does it because he loves it and uh, he he just takes on people that will fit into the squad and where it's it's kind of like a little footy team really like we are so invested in each other's performances and uh, that's so special when we get to the games and, and I know Rogues, Rogues had his 1500 metres just after mine and he uh, you know, halted his warm up and you know, maybe even risked missing the call room uh, to make sure that he stayed out to watch the race and, and his voice was the first I heard after I crossed the line and stuff like that's really special because you know, he's my hero in the sport and I've grown up admiring him so um, yeah, it's just I'm so lucky to be part of the group that I'm a part of. Mm, for sure. And then, like outside of running for you, like people know that you've written a few articles for Runners Tribe. I know you're doing a few speaking engagements now. You got one with Toyota later on today, I think. Like you've got the yeah. VIS scholarship kind of thing. So, what's life look like outside of running, and how do you make it all work? Um, yeah. So obviously, a lot of my uh, income I've is coming from my running but then my public speaking and, and my writing so writing's a little bit of a hobby kind of passion but public speaking is is probably on a more serious note where uh i'm probably getting uh more chance to have an impact on on people so uh you know my, my talk today is on disability in the workplace and and as well as my road to tokyo so being able to do that is you know hugely important to me but then again, I, I can't say yes to everything because training is so important and my investment in performing well at Tokyo will then give me a better chance in the future to have an impact. So um, there's a lot to consider and I organise most of it. I organise all of it by myself, um, just getting advice off mum and, um, and off Paralympics Australia. So, uh, yeah, there's a bit of admin to do, but I really enjoy it. And, um, yeah, if I can make a difference in even a small way, uh, it's obviously worth it yeah cool and then like we started december i think i may have seen your name down for uh steig and hashtag one would that be correct yeah i uh i it's such a cool concept i didn't want to miss out although i'm not um gonna start racing uh you know the proper race distances until maybe late jan early feb as i'm i've had a a bit of a break from intensive training. I was my first time on the track last night, so um, yeah, whoever's drafting should probably know that. But uh, I think I'll still be able to um, put up a decent fight in the race. But it's such a cool concept, and doing that stuff for athletics is is really exciting. Yeah, for sure. You'll be like you'll easy get through the three k and the mile. Like I'll, I reckon you'll be in the last fifteen, sixteen. Yeah, well, it's funny. Like this, I'm going to draft con- you on our team. Yeah, well, this concept would actually work. This would fit me perfectly um, if I was in the same shape as I was in Dubai, which I'm, I'm sure I'm not too far off. But Get a week's training <laughs> under your belt, you'll be fine. Yeah, well, that's it. So, I don't know, maybe I'll, um, maybe I'll still do really well. Uh, it's going to be cool. Yeah, yeah, what are your thoughts on, like, athletics and stuff at the moment and kind of the, the Steigen kind of trying to be innovative and, like, we had Matt Whitbread on the show last week talking about some yeah. of the changes they're making up in Sydney and... Like, I think if I was ever putting a panel together of guys that I wanted to 
you know, get their ideas for innovation and make the sport more popular and driven with, like, media exposure, I reckon you'd be one of the guys I'd ask to be on the panel. So, like, what are your kind of thoughts on it all at the moment? Yeah, I think athletics has, or at least, you know, running especially, has so much potential. Running's got to be one of the most participated in sports, uh, and yet a lot of the elites uh, are relatively unknown to most of those people, which is, you know... That's something that surely we can change, and and your podcast that's that's doing quite a lot in that area, and that's that's something that we have to look at. And I think events like this, because if you look at the Tour de France, uh, and you look at why people follow football, and it's usually to do with a team, um, and and people can it's, it's it goes beyond the individual. People can follow something, a symbol that is not just the person, um, and they. You know, I, I follow the Carlton Football Club, but I don't know any of the players personally. But I still feel invested because I'm invested in the symbol that is the club. So I don't know. I think there's something in that that, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I'm not quite sure on how. But well, you maybe see it in Japan, don't you, with their like Ekaden teams and how they run for a, a company all year round and stuff like that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, I think that's some somehow we need to go down that path and and obviously keep all of the traditional distances um, because the Olympics is still and will always be what the main part of our sport is. But I think on the side, um, yeah, something like a team format kind of season that isn't cheapened with, you know, weird events maybe. Uh, you know, I think there's something there. I, I don't know how, quite how, but I think Steigen and, and stuff like, yeah, that, that the National Mile Championships, that, that stuff's really cool. So, yeah, I've just got to tap into that kind of innovation. Yeah, and you're right about that team concept with um, like the AV Winter. Like you look at how many yeah. people rock up to run Div Five or Div Seven or Div One or whatever it is. Like you just run around a muddy kind of park yeah. with a whole lot of hundreds of people, but it's that you're representing more than yourself, and then people buy into that. I think you've, you've nailed that a bit there, and I, yeah, I hadn't really thought about that too much in the in the past. Yeah, I, I, oh, I my favorite races to run, like my most enjoyable races are the cross country series races because I love the area that I I live in I think it's awesome for running and it's kind of like if I'm representing the club I'm also representing the area so it's kind of like I feel like I'm representing something bigger than just my own ambitions and yeah I think you know that that's what sparks the most um passion Beautiful, mate. So we'll see you at Steigen and then you like will you have to then back up to do like our nationals and stuff yeah, so my races over the summer will probably not. Uh, uh, there's no focus on running well, just just training. But Victorian champs and national champs, I'll have a mini peek uh, for because I think the heats and nationals in the final at Vic champs will mimic reasonably closely what Tokyo might be like. So um, yeah, but otherwise uh, this season there's no there's no real pressure to perform well, um, and you know all, all our training will be focused towards peaking in early september yeah and will you get to falls creek for some altitude work over the new year um i've i've slowly transitioned away from falls creek just because the terrain is yeah. um too difficult but i really do like it up there but we're going to go to uh perisher yeah yeah mount kosciuszko which is uh quite a lot better for me just more dirt roads rather than single track kind of uh stuff but yeah definitely some altitude there then i'll do some heat training in Canberra because my races in Tokyo uh, for some reason have been put in the middle of the day um, which is going to be pretty brutal uh, so yeah just got to prepare for the heat too so yeah it'll be a lot between uh, a lot of trips between Melbourne and Canberra yeah and what is the turnaround with the um, the 1500 and the 5k like similar to world champs oh, I have no idea who does the timetabling at these <laughs> these games because there's only two well, I suppose there's three, if you count the marathon, events that my category can do that's distance running. Uh, and they've put them all within like five days in a in a 14-day program of athletics pretty much. So it's uh, 5K first, one day off, 1,500 heats, 1,500 final, all in the middle of the day. So that's why my that's why I was so relieved after the 5K in Dubai because I, if I hadn't have won, I would have decided not to do it. 
Um, I would have just done the 15, but because I've won now, I'll, I'll be able to have a crack at both. So I don't know why they do that um, with the, the timetabling. They could easily spread it out. but Yeah, uh, that's going to be tough, isn't it? it? Like backing up for a 1,500-meter heat with um, a 5K pretty much still in your legs. Yeah, that's the risk because obviously I, I just want to win even one gold medal. Um, so if it happens in the 5K, then the pressure's off. Uh, doesn't matter how sore I am I can just try my best but if I absolutely empty myself and it's and it's a silver and that then hinders me for the 1500 uh, and then I because of that you know soreness I, I don't win the 1500 either it could backfire so I've um, really it's been a well when the program came out I was um, pretty upset because it just it just wasn't how I'd envisioned it um, and and yeah I had to overcome that initial shock and, and realize that i just got to work with what I can. And it's the Paralympic Games. It's not meant to be easy. Yeah, for sure. And you guys have got a good team, good coach. You guys will be able to prepare for that and replicate yeah. your training and see how your body feels and make adjustments and, and go from there. Before I do let you go, though, you did uh, just mention the, the M word, the marathon, and you didn't really sound <laughs> too keen on it. Are we going to see you on the road sometime? Oh, definitely. Uh, I think... How soon depends on uh, how 2020 goes on the track and 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 the years after that. I uh, yeah have boxes with you know medals I want to win on the track uh, before I'd go to the marathon. But um, it could be it could be sooner than I think at the moment, or it could be yeah later. With 2032 now, uh, the bids being put in by the Queensland government. Uh, yeah, I'd definitely be sticking around for those games if um if that ended up getting up. So there's plenty of years for me to do the marathon. And I think the marathon is the best event in the sport. So I think if I didn't go there, I'd be being a bit silly. Yeah, and we see a lot of successful track guys go to the roads because of the money for the uh, marathoning. And is that similar in like para sport as well? Like there's more money on the roads than the track or not so much? You stay on the track and get the funding. Right now, I mean, the funding for medals is the same, but in terms of getting exposure on TV and stuff, uh, traditionally the track's been better because sometimes they don't have the cameras out on the course for the marathon. But mm. um, now, you know, Rogues is is capitalising on it. There's, you know, a race at London. Uh, he's been invited. I don't know if he's doing it yet or not, but he's been invited to a, a new para race at Boston. Um, then... New York's looking at it, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, Berlin as well, potentially. So, uh, yeah, by the time I get there, there could be a fully uh, fully fledged para marathon circuit, um, which would be pretty pretty awesome. So, um, I just lo- love the thought of doing a marathon. But if there's money there, uh, that'll definitely be an extra motivation. Yeah, that sounds cool about the Boston stuff. I didn't know that, and then you'd yeah, expect them all to follow suit. Yeah, well, that's what I was. I was thinking if if Boston will do it, then I'm sure other places in America will do it. So it's exciting times. Beautiful, mate. Well, thanks again for your time, listeners. If you want to know more about Jared, as I said, uh, tell me your tale. September 14, 2017. Any uh, sponsors or anyone we need to thank before we finish off, mate? Uh, just yeah, Paralympics Australia. That that whole community, my my club at Diamond Valley, um, the support from running groups like Diamond Creek Runners and Crosby Crew. And um, I've been lucky this year to have Lauren Burns, Olympic Taekwondo champion in my corner because of the Sport Australia Hall of Fame and, and Athletics Australia and, and, and all those kind of people in the Victorian Institute of Sport. So I, I really couldn't have done it without them and, and obviously, yeah, my family and my training partners. So they're, they're the people that, that uh, make it happen. And in regards to uh, speaking gigs as well, mate, if someone's out there listening and think you'd be a good fit for their staff or their business or their school or whatever it is, uh, how do people go about that? Yeah, uh, my email address is jaredcliff at gmail.com, so uh, J-A-R-Y-D-C-L-I-F-F, uh, or just contact me through Twitter and Instagram, and, and um, yeah, usually I'm, I'm pretty, pretty flexible with getting to most places, so uh, yeah, if you... If you think I'm I'm worthy, then definitely hit me up. Yeah, for sure. Awesome, mate. Well, thanks again for your time, giving it up for the Inside Rome podcast. We really appreciate it. 
No, thank you very much, and, and thanks for what you guys are doing for the running community. Mate, we just talk rubbish about running every week, <laughs> and then, then we get to interview legends like you. So it's a, it's a good opportunity for us to talk to people. No, thank you very much.